Hey, it's Kelly. Welcome to the podcast. Just a little heads up in today's talk, we mention client suicide and very stressful situations in clinical care. Please take care of yourself and decide if this is the right podcast episode for you. Welcome to the podcast. Today we are joined by Jennifer Brandstetter in Indiana and Ohio. Well, she has practices in both states. So I'm really excited to share her process and her journey in starting her practice and growing her practice. Welcome, Jennifer. Thank you, Kelly. I'm glad to mark this off of my goal list from last round of boot camp last spring. You wanted to be on the podcast? Yes, I set that as my goal. I said, I'm going to be on the podcast. I thought it would be by fall, but that's okay. It was a pandemic. So. <laughs> it was a pandemic <laughs> year, so, you know, I'm happy to have you on here. Um, just before we started recording, we were catching up on how things have been going, and um, you've been in boot camp for how long now? Um, a little over a year. Yeah, so I started yeah. like December of 2019. Yeah. So let's talk a little bit about what life was like when you, when did you start your practice and why? Um, so although I started thinking about and learning about private practice back in like 2012, and I had done all of those any me free mm -hmm. trainings and I had done a lot of the work and it was funny, all of like my blog ideas and my niche ideas are, were the same, like, you know, oh, yeah. six years later, which was cool. Wow. Um, yeah. But so I had been planning that, but then sort of really desperately needed to get out of agency work because I was so burned out and an opportunity came up to contract with another private practice. Mm -hmm. So I did that. And then while I was doing that, I also started doing some online work with BetterHelp um, and some other like Maven Clinic, some of these online platforms. Yes. Um, and so I was kind of doing both. And then I had my daughter and... Um, that was October of 2017. And I realized that I was doing a lot more like the online work was picking up and it was making, unfortunately, the same amount of money that I was making at, um, at the private practice, which was not enough. So I figured why not stay home with my daughter and cut out the drive. Um, so I did online only. And when I left that practice, I also got credentialed with insurance on my own. Mm -hmm. So that was about like 2018. So it's been um, two and a half years or so since I've been all online and all on my own. Um, I, I live in Indiana right across the border from Ohio. So I have yes. a license in both <laughs> states, had to get credentialed sometimes in both states. Um, mm -hmm. That was fun. So <laughs> that's, um, so that's where I was at. So then like, you know, when I got to boot camp, I was sort of, I wasn't really doing any marketing. I just did um, like psychology today and I was on insurance panels. So sometimes people will call from that or just old clients from the old practice. And then, um, but the bulk of my work I was doing at that time was with better help and then eventually Teladoc. Let's talk about those two. <sighs> I've been saying in boot camp for a while that I want to write about it. I, I continue to think about what to say, because every time I scroll my Facebook feed, I see a celebrity promoting better help or, you know, a, one of those talk space, those kinds of, of services. And first of all, those ads, those people are getting money. Anytime someone, you know, and signs up, you know, there's an affiliate there, or they're being paid, you know, to do an ad. And it's great for the client to have access, but what it's, I see it doing is harm to our field and to clinicians. And I'm curious what your experience was of that. Um, I don't know how much time we have, but I have a lot <laughs> to say about that. Um, I did, I've kind of been on almost all of the platforms. So I will say that um, out of all of them, I was on BetterHelp the longest. Um, I did join Talkspace and I quit within the first day of seeing clients. Um, so they're all a little bit different. With BetterHelp particularly, what I liked is they just kind of, it was your own practice. They didn't 
have any clinical oversight telling you what to do, what to say, how to say it, exactly when to say it, like Talkspace did. Mm -hmm. And Talkspace was like, you have to, everything was reviewed. You had to meet with your clinical team. I mean, it was very, a lot of oversight. You have to check in with everybody twice a day. Um, That didn't work for me um, at the time. BetterHelp was kind of like a free-for-all, which is great if you're a good clinician and you work really well with that model. But the, the benefits to the therapist for me at the time being home with my daughter is if she was awake at four in the morning, I could check my messages Mm -hmm. um, and you know, the texting therapy. So like the asynchronous or however you say it, um, messaging is, um, that was a benefit that like people would message me when they had time or when they were in crisis, kind of like, okay, this is what's happening right now. These are my thoughts. This is what I'm doing. And there wasn't an expectation that I would get back to them right away, but then I was able to actually review rather than, you know, the next week being like, so what happened when you were angry on last Wednesday? Mm -hmm. You know, so that was a benefit. Um, The problem is I struggle with boundaries um, and overgiving, and that's very easy to do with that service because um, of the writing. And you also get paid by word count. So there is an incentive to write a lot. Um, and for the client to write a lot. And then the sessions, um, they cap the sessions at, you know, whatever the, it's like 50 minutes. After that, you won't get paid anymore. Mm -hmm. Um, And at that time, they did start, but at that time, you did not get um, compensated for no shows, late cancellations. So the clients did not have a lot of boundaries. Um, They also capped your pay per client. So, and I don't know if there's not anything in the contract where I can't say what I was paid, but I'm just going to say it. So therapists know now this was, you know, a year ago, it was like $25 a session. And, um, you could make the max you could make in a month on what any one client is $150. Um, and then you could get bonuses for keeping clients long-term. So if you had, I think it started at 10 clients, if you had them longer than 90 days and they were engaging each of those months, then you would get a bonus at like $200 or something. And then it would go up. And at some points, like I did, I mean, I would get like a $500 bonus because I had some long-term clients. Incentives to keep clients on long-term and not solve their problems if they are shorter-term problems, I think is unethical. Um, As well as, you know, the clients could also mark messages as urgent. Um, And that was an icky feeling. Um, There's like a sense of anonymity and sometimes their emergency contact was valid and sometimes it wasn't. And sometimes I would get a message. I remember getting a message, you know, I just tried to hang myself in the closet and the belt Mm -hmm. broke and I get out of a session with another client and read that. And Oh my God, can't get a hold of the client. I send the police there and then they send me an email. The client sends, you know, oh my God, I was taking a nap. I can't believe you did that. And then leaves me like a scathing review. And then they get to switch counselors at any time and say that was a terrible counselor. So then they up and leave. You have no way of contacting them. Um, Mm -hmm. So, and that's for any reason at all. You know, they could, you could get a client on your caseload. They're like, hey, and if you don't respond within 10 minutes of like getting that client at 3 a.m., they're like, they mark you as unresponsive and switch clients. So I, I remember you being in boot camp and talking about better help and this yes. stress, which just yes. hearing about it again, I don't know if anyone else is listening, but it's, um, it's intense to feel it. Like yes. I feel it from you, like even in boot camp when we're typing back and forth or doing a loom video, I can feel it from, I remember feeling it from Jennifer when she would post about better help and I think that that's something that a lot of therapists have considered and I get it. You had a a child, you wanted to be home with them. You didn't have a practice going yet. Really. You were just contracting. Um, and that's, so it made sense. So how do you, how did you move from doing this kind of work, which if you can't hear the burnout that it was creating Jennifer, like, my God, yeah, I would be in bed at midnight, like, and my husband's like, why are you on your phone? I'm like, oh, a client messaged me. Like, let me just send this message real quick. And it was like, it's a never ending, like pile of work, 
you know, it's like laundry, you finish one and then something else is dirty. So it's just like, and for me personally, I didn't work well with that. And I would set boundaries like, Hey, I only check in twice a day on my messages. Some clients would message multiple times a day and it would be paragraphs, paragraphs, paragraphs. So like they would max out the money I was making. So yeah, I was so burned out. Oh my gosh. Mm -hmm. So burned out. I had no time for anything. So how to change it? Um, so I, I don't remember exactly what the process was of how I got to boot camp, but I know that I got some sort of email, I'm sure. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and I didn't ignore it, but you were running a deal and it was a little more affordable for, you know, what I thought, but of course there was a payment plan too. And I'm like, you know what? Merry Christmas to me. It was December. I'm like, I have to do this. Um, it was taking a toll on my physical health, my family, you know, my daughter was older, so she was getting a lot more active. Um, I couldn't just like feed her and read my phone anymore. So it was just, it wasn't working for, any, for me anymore. And some of like the clients, it was an inappropriate, I think it just wasn't good clinically because they became dependent on my messages. Um, they became dependent on me because they had almost constant access to me. So it was, for me, that just wasn't good emotionally. Um, so I ended up going ahead and um, starting boot camp, and I got access to the modules right away. And um, I just started working through them. And I think, like, just looking through the whole process and learning about like building a business, I mean, that's the whole other side of private practice that nobody taught me. The woman who I was contracting with, she clearly didn't have like a business plan because her, her accountant didn't even tell her to save for taxes. So she got a huge tax bill after her first year, like surprise. Um, she was paying me $25 a session mm -hmm. and she was only charging $100 a session. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, and then she would charge the client for a no-show and I'd be sitting there in the office and I wouldn't get anything for it. Um, I don't know. It was just like, it wasn't working and I wanted to do something different. And I feel like there was so much negative um, chatter in my mind. I remember my first day of grad school, I think it was the first day, a professor saying that private practice is an expensive hobby. Mm. Um, and it makes me so mad. And I actually told, um, I think I told somebody who works in the office with her now, but um, I, it made me so mad because I'm like, it doesn't have to be. Now that I've learned about like business planning and like the value of what we do and why charging more for like charging our worth is actually beneficial to the clients. Mm -hmm. um, it's just, it totally changed my mind and, and walking through the process. It just really, it helped me have the confidence of like knowing actually what to do. Mm -hmm. um, so, so that was the process. So I started thinking about, okay, well, I'm going to build up my private pay people or, or get it all set before I dump the insurance panels and the, um, you know, better help and teledoc. Yeah. So teledoc was just videos and that was $50 a session, which was better. Mm -hmm. um, and then of course, insurance, like I'd be chasing down money that I never ended up getting. So that it, it just wasn't working. Mm -hmm. So um, yeah. So I, I know that there was some kind of training in like January of that year. Wasn't there like last year, there was some kind of something. Like because, a bonus training we had. Yeah. Yeah. So that's, I think that's what really jump started things. And then once I got to spring boot camp, my first round, um, what really got me to like, oh my gosh, I need to do full on private pay was just going through the modules and hearing other people's stories. And really what, you know, and I, you know, I just shared this with you earlier, like what got me to get off of those um, online companies was I was doing, it was during one of the live video calls, like Q and A sessions and mm -hmm. you and Miranda were on the video. And um, I was saying, you know, again, I feel like I've talked it to death about better help and I'm so burned out and better help and teledoc better. I've like said those words so many times. And one of you, I don't remember who said, um, it seems like you're valuing your clients more than your family. And that was just like a knife to my gut. I was like, oh my God, I am. Like, it's like the clients needed me. It was the pandemic too. So it's like, oh, anybody who needed, I had so many people desperate for help. And I'm like, I have to help them. But it's like, we were going through a pandemic too. 
you know, like, why did I think I had to be the superhero Mm -hmm. and help everybody else? Mm -hmm. Like, yeah. So I just overexerted, um, was completely burned out. And like, when I heard those words, I was like, you know, I really need to change. Um, so I did. So the next day I put in my notice there and I put in my notice to insurance. And then I think the end of June was when I was completely off of everything except for one insurance panel that lingered for a couple months. Mm -hmm. Um, but yeah, so then, um, and actually I've had several teledoc and better help clients follow me (laughs) uh, in private pay, you know? So I was thinking, Oh, they only pay like the teledoc that was part of their insurance coverage. So it was free, but Mm -hmm. they were willing to pay private pay or some of my tele or better help people were on a scholarship and they still, um, they still come to me, you know, a year later. Mm -hmm. I remember that time period of like, okay, which is the worst we get rid of first, then the next one, then the next one. Yeah. And I do vaguely remember the conversation. And I want to be clear that you were in a position where you could at least make some changes. I know some people yes. are doing what they can to take care yeah. of their families and things. And I know you were motivated by that, but you were also at the time frustrated with your lack of time with your daughter about how things were getting interrupted. And it was very hard. I mean, to hold the boundaries with that kind of formatting. And so well, now and I, go ahead. Uh, no, um, the other thing too, and now I just lost my train of thought. Um, oh, when I did the math, I only needed five private pay clients to replace my income. So that's really what, I mean, cause I still needed to make like a minimum yes. amount of income, but I'm like, okay, well, if I could get five clients, mm-hmm. like, yeah, it came down to math. Yep. I know it, it's, it's the, it's the funniest thing. Like I believe in intuition, but I also believe in the numbers too, that can help mm-hmm. us make some of those decisions. And, you know, what are some things that have helped you keep from having that burnout in your own practice? Because sometimes we leave organizations mm-hmm. and we keep doing the same stuff, like the boundary yeah. thing, you can easily <laughs> yes. replicate that in your private practice. Yes. So what have you been working to do to mitigate the burnout? Um, well, I see my own therapist, so that has been helpful and she owns a private practice. So that's why I connected with her because she can help me with that to understand and hold me accountable, um, to the boundaries, um, because it's an issue I just like personally struggle with is Mm -hmm. doing things for other people and taking on too much. So, um, that has been helpful. Um, I also, oh, one of the benefits that I'm so grateful for with boot camp is my buddies. So I have, uh, there's a group of three of us that have met monthly now for over a year, which wow. is crazy. And so it's really nice to just talk about and see each other grow to, okay, what's my goal. And then like, oh my gosh, I'm full and I'm taking on too much and, or, or what else, you know, so mm-hmm. it has been helpful to just, just be accountable every month. Like, how are we doing? Like, am I taking on too much? Um, I think just like, remembering how bad it felt. Um, and I, I pick up pretty quickly if I'm going in the wrong direction. Um, so like with, I have one, um, you know, case in particular that recently I was like, I feel like I'm, I'm doing too much maybe. So I just paid for a consultation, um, with an expert, super helpful, super Mm -hmm. helpful. Mm -hmm. So it's like, Oh, okay. I need to rein it back in and do something different. So not doing it alone. No, it's like, I didn't care. And what's so nice is like, when I was working, I never thought I could pay another therapist $200 for her time just to consult on a case. Mm -hmm. And I'm not saying that I make a ton of money right now. I'm like, just now starting to get like comfortable, but like, I saw the value in that because it was going to help me just overall with my practice. Mm -hmm. One of the other things you had mentioned before we started recording too, was outcomes and the importance of that in private practice. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yes. So the outcomes conversations that are part of the training, and I think it was part of the marketing masterclass that I did. Mm -hmm. Um, I did that when I was still doing um, Teladoc. I remember, because I remember a couple of those conversations. Um, 
that was essential for me to have a marketing message, first of all, to know what, why I, you know, why people should come to me. Um, I got really good feedback from clients um, about what it is specifically that I help with. Um, So that part was really helpful. And then it also gave me the confidence to go into full fee private practice because I'm like, oh, I actually am helping people. Mm -hmm. Uh, And then of course, with the clients having those conversations and allowing that space to kind of be vulnerable and for them to give me constructive feedback that was just really good clinically for them to be able to say, Hey, yeah, I'd like more of this or, or less of that. Um, and then, you know, once I got into private practice, I noticed that the less burnout and less clients meant better outcomes for my clients. So I have the time now to think about a case or think about, or send resources in between sessions that I'm like, Oh, I think, you know, my client might like this. Mm -hmm. Um, I have the time, you know, I called a psychiatrist the other day and like, this is rare, but we talked for a half an hour, Mm -hmm. like half an hour with a psychiatrist. Like I never would have had that time. Um, and I wouldn't have ever expected it, but it was super helpful because it's going to help that client. Um, and it's also going to help my practice because he understood what I do and I understand how he works. Yeah. So, yeah, I mean, the outcomes are just, I mean, it, I can't even explain. I don't want to say I was doing bad work before because I think I was helping people, but I'm doing much more rich clinical work now. It's beautiful. So where do you think is your next growth edge in your practice? Oh man. Um, I think, I mean, right now I, you know, I just said that about boundaries, but two weeks ago I was like way over my, my goal of how many client sessions a week and I was feeling burned out. So I'm like, what am I doing? Um, but I was able to rein it back in. So, um, so having the boundaries, I think like that's going to be important is having boundaries on my time, like Mm -hmm. how many slots are available. Mm -hmm. Um, Being able to say I'm not taking new clients, that was hard, Um, but I did it for last month and this month. Mm -hmm. And then, um, you know, the other thing, so I didn't mention that I I did contract with Lyra Health, which is an EAP that pays a fair fee for sessions. Mm -hmm. And, um, And I've really liked it. I've liked working with them and the clients that I've gotten have been a really good fit. So for now, I think it's wonderful. It filled up my practice very quickly. Um, while I'm still growing like my private pay clients, um, I'm still getting referrals, but that just really helped kind of round out my caseload. Um, but what I'd still like to move forward on is honing in my marketing and my, you know, for my private practice, like for the private full fee. Mm -hmm. practice. Um, just because that's still like, that's my thing, you know, it, I don't have anybody else to answer to. I don't have to submit any billing or do it, you know, Mm -hmm. it's just, just me and how I want to run the business. So that's really my next step is, um, honing my marketing plan, um, for the next round of boot camp. That's my plan. I think when the decision about Lyra came up, one of the things we talked about was going back to the numbers for some people in here, it does make sense and it works out beautifully and they're okay with it. And you also know the limit, right? There's a mix of how much you're willing to take of those clients versus your private pay. And it's about creating the formula that makes the most sense for you. And I think that's the beauty about practice is that what I love about your story, Jennifer, is you've had lots of different iterations and that with each iteration, you get to, you are figuring out what you like and don't like, and then you adapt and change accordingly. And also as your family changes and grows and does different things and, you know, you get to adapt your business accordingly too. Right. So well, and we just got full-time childcare at the beginning of the year for the first time ever. So that has been like a game changer for my practice too. So that that's made a huge difference. Yeah. I mean, to do all of this in a pandemic year. Yeah. I was just thinking that I was just thinking that when I was looking at, um, you know, just what was going on last year and it's like, wow, like I built my private practice during the pandemic. Like, I, I can't believe I did that. Like, <laughs> that's scary, (laughs) you know, but I was so burned out. And like, 
I will say that you both had the confidence and like there were enough success stories from, you know, boot campers that it really helped me be like, okay, I can do this. Um, Mm -hmm. And I always said like, if I can't, I can always go back. Like I Mm -hmm. can always get on insurance panels. I can always go back to better help. Like, Mm -hmm. um, so just knowing that was kind of like a safety net too. I also want to just quickly touch on the fact that you were in two states. And this is one of the things that came up during the pandemic was like, should I get licensed in other states and oh. things? And you're in, the, <laughs> you know, the trials of doing that. Yeah. But I think for you, it made sense because you lived right on the border. You yeah. had lived in both states and things. Yeah. But still, with your marketing, one of the things we've talked about is focusing on one area, though. Mm-hmm. So that way it helps you with your marketing how has that been going um I think it's going better it was very confusing and I did I mean I went through all the trainings about the you know marketing in two states and all of that um what I struggled with is I live in a very rural area so Mm -hmm. I'm not going to market where I'm at I also didn't want to use my address Mm -hmm. um but I'm about an hour outside of Cincinnati and that's where like a big portion of my network is. Um, so I ended up finding a, a, a physical office address that I can use for mail and for my Google listing, because doing a service area, just, I feel like it wasn't really doing much for me. Right. And then, <clears throat> you know, even doing like the, the market research and keyword research, I just wasn't finding the right fit. Um, I, I was including Oxford, Ohio, which is where I previously had my, um, where I worked in that private practice and I still get a lot of clients there, but it still wasn't really, it wasn't right for me to focus, um, my, my marketing. So what I've decided now is, I mean, right now I'm not taking on new clients and I know I still need to be doing marketing and I will, but, (laughs) but, um, I think having just an office address and saying like, you know what, I'm just going to do Cincinnati, slap Cincinnati on everything. Simplifies, doesn't it? Yes. <laughs> and then, you know, because of SEO, I know that takes a long time and that stuff, like that's part of this that like, I don't, I've done the trainings like multiple times, like the videos. And I'm like, I still, I get it, but I don't. So, so we're it's going like, to deal with it the next yeah. time. That's fine. <laughs> or I'm going to outsource and there I'm okay go. with that, yes. you know? But yeah, yeah. So I think that's been, and the other challenge of working in two states is that like, I, I have to build new relationships with providers. I mean, I, I'm cold calling somebody in Cleveland saying like, yeah, I see your, your, your patient, but I'm down in Indiana. And they're like, who are you? (laughs) You know, um, but I have had some like really good connections with some providers. And honestly, it's the same as if they were local. Some, some doctors don't care. Some do. Yeah. So for those of you who are in multiple locations, still with your marketing, we encourage focusing on one area just to reduce the confusion to start. So that way it gives you some direction and focus. And Um, and I was still getting people from all over both states. You will, you will still get diversity, but at least you're not running all over from both states. (laughs) Yes. Um, So for people who are in the midst of their practices, who have felt the burnout, who are, you know, struggling with what kind of model do they need to go with here that's going to make them happy, that's going to work for their clients? What what words of encouragement do you have for them? Um, I would say if you have a plan, you can make whatever model, having a plan and having guidance. like a specific business plan is very important. That's not anything that we were taught. Um, and it takes away the overwhelm of like, how do I even like approach like, oh yeah, that would be nice to have a full fee private practice, but like, how would I even get there? Mm -hmm. Um, the other thing is to, you know, like you said, look at the numbers and consider the numbers of like, okay, I, I was on one insurance panel that paid $62 a session but there were four or five sessions from a client that never got reimbursed. And I spent hours trying going back and forth with the client, her mom, the insurance company, and I eventually gave up. So if you think about that, 
when you break down the money, it's like per hour, what was I making a dollar? Like, you know, with how much time I spent on the billing. Now, granted, you can outsource the billing. Um, for me, it was also a little bit different because I'm in two different states. And with the um, telehealth before the pandemic, people were like, oh, I don't, you know, I would get kickbacks because, oh, you do telehealth. Where's your service location? All of that. So, um, so I think like having a plan um, or getting help with, with a plan is essential, whether it's a business coach or a program like this. I know there are multiple, but like having some help or some sort of structure is what's really going to help figure out like what model will work for me and, um, and then how to do it, but also address the mental um, chatter that can get in the way. Mm-hmm. Um, Cause that was a, that's a big roadblock about like what you're worth and what will people pay. I have to say this. I had a client who told me she was a better help client. She pays $150 a session almost every week. She told me last year she made $15,000 with her job. Mm-hmm. So I thought that only wealthy people could afford to be in therapy with me, but she pays $600 a month for therapy because she finds it that helpful and that important for her mental health. Mm-hmm. Um, I have another client who makes, she, I think she said $25,000 a year. Um, so my impressions of what people are willing to pay or able to pay for holding me back from charging the fee that allows me to see less people, be less stressed. And then I give really good therapy. I love that. That's great. Yeah. Well, if people want to check you out, how can they find you, Jennifer? Um, you can go to midwestpsychotherapy.com. That's my website. I'm also on Facebook. It's um, Jennifer Brandstetter LCSW. Um, or, you know, my email address is. No, well, just so they can check out your website. You yeah, don't need just, people. Okay, email I don't you. know. Busy enough. <laughs> I know. Yeah, go to the website. Yes. Yeah. All yeah. Right. All right. And for those of you who are inspired by Jennifer's story, please share, comment, like subscribe, all the things that you're supposed to do. But more importantly, I think it's just important we elevate each other's voices because there is hope here that things can change, that we can still make an impact in our communities while taking care of ourselves. Um, So take care of you guys. We will see you the next time.